Hello, I'm Roberto, and it seems that there's a lot of object oriented programmers in here. And I, I thought to start with a conference in a little room with not so many people, but it seems that it's not like that. Uh, well, my talk is about uh, what's wrong with object oriented programmer. And when it comes with OOP, I really believed in it. I really tried for years and years uh, to do my code better, do it right, do it again, do it right, do it again. But it, something is really wrong. And that's why the title of my talk is What's Wrong with Object Oriented Programming? The subtitle is a tale about weird habits on software developers. And it's not a case that I used the word habit. When it comes to habits, the definition from Oxford Dictionary is that is a thing that you do almost without thinking. Especially that is it's something that is really hard to stop doing. And why I started with habits? The habit de definition is because what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is all about habits. Before to start, I, I really think that you need to know who Alan Kay is. Does anyone know who Alan Kay is? Okay, we can skip the... Well, uh, Alan Kay is as you can see, the father of object oriented programming. And uh, he conceived laptop. As you can see, he contributed to the client server model. Uh, the definition of Ethernet is the father of user interface and small talk. As you can see, he worked for Xerox. And is not that much stupid guy. Uh, but when someone asked him what he think about OOP, how it has been implemented. There are two famous sentences. The first is about C++. And he said that I made up the term object-oriented, but I can tell you that I don't really have C++ in mind. And the worst is when it comes to Java and C Sharp. What about Java? That is the same for C Sharp, that are the <laughs> mainstream languages. He said that is the most distressing, distressing thing to happen to computing since MS-DOS. Uh, well, the fact is that with Java and, and C Sharp language, we are making money. So how can it be possible that Alan Kay is telling us that Java and C Sharp are the most distressing thing that are actually happening? Well, it seems that I'm not the only one to be disappointed of that. In fact, in two th 2003, a guy called Stephen Ram, that uh, was at the time a university student, wrote a letter directly to him, an email, sorry. And this is the original one. Uh, actually, I copied and paste. And he would like just to have some alternative words on the term object-oriented programming because he was really confused about that. He was there looking all around for the definition, but if you get 10 different books, you have 10 different definitions. And Helen Kay replied with a long letter. These are just the key points about my thoughts. And he said that object for me are just like biological cells that are able to communicate through messages. That was his vision because he is a, a scientist that studies biology. That's why I, he imagined that. And about the things like inheritance and all the other things that you know are about OOP, He's saying that, that he decided to leave inheritance as a built-in feature until he understood that. So even for inheritance, that is one of the K 
key of OOP. It seems to be really disappointed with that. And I don't know if you can see, but in the gray part, is really is telling that he has been inspired by Simula, that uh, is the language that Smalltalk is coming from. And they were using inheritance, but he really wasn't <coughs> fine with that. Uh, but he, he decided to leave that because um, Nihar and Hal, that are two famous des language designer, made that, so he decided to leave the inheritance. Um, well, the original small talk came out of the both. So, object talking with messages, imaging that as biological cells with the inheritance, and the, the sex, uh, what came up with the second small talk implementation, uh, software developer decided to leave inheritance even if by trying to use it, inheritance was not the best thing to say, but they leave it there. At the end of the message, uh, say, that is the definition, is what he dreamed about for OOP. He dreamed about a paradigm that were, were just about messaging, local retention, and protection of state and process and is not bound with any language, is just how to organize your code. And you can do that in Smalltalk or in Lisp. The really important thing is that you hide the state and you have behavior exposed to talk via messages with other object. So, the picture is something like that, nothing more, our object that contains local states and behavior, and through behaviors and messages communication, they synchronize, uh, sorry, they talk with other objects. Inheritance is not in the picture, because that was going to complicate all the stuffs. But I guess that if you all are object-oriented programmer, you know what, what I mean. So, this is the original dream about object-oriented, but how we really perceived that? What happened to the dream? And to do that, we should maybe try to do some OOP. I decided to remove the Haskell and C-sharp, as I said in this paper, because the more I look around, the more, the more I go deep to do this presentation, and the more things w went really wrong. My first purposes were even to save OOP. My first purpose was how OOP is similar to functional programming. But if you are far from the dream and you stay with the implementation, what are the tools that we use nowadays? You cannot do it. Okay. OOP is actually the kingdom of knowns. This is the best definition of OOP. OOP is all about knowns. Verbs are things that cannot be Nothing that slaves in the kingdom of knowns. You have always to create a new known if you want a new verb. So if you want to have an action, you have to create a known. You have to think about it. And every time you will look again to the code and the naming that you made up, you probably will be disappointing because verbs are verbs and knowns are knowns. But in the object-oriented world, the kingdom if, is all about knowns. If you get a book, probably you will find something like that. If you want to design your first OOP code, 
you had to take your requirement, circle all knowns, and those are your classes. Then you had to underline, hold the adjective, and those are your properties. Then highlight your verbs, those are your methods. And this is what we are going to do. This is the requirement. Bob, a bald and nearsighted guy, that's me, smokes a cigarette. So, Bob is the known, cigarette is the other one. And then you have the properties where we can even ignore that, but I need to be stick with the definition. Bald and nearsighted, nearsighted. And the behavior that you, you want to expose, the action of Bob as smokes. So probably the first implementation that you can think about it is something like that. You have the class person with public methods, with get and set. You can imagine for C Sharp as properties, uh, what about Java is method get here style or get body look. And that is the behavior method smoke. And inside the method of smoke, you have the implementation. But this seems to be really good. I don't see nothing wrong with that. But the smoking action is made up of other action. This is what a verb is about. So to complete a smoking action, you have four examples. This is pure imagination. To retrieve a cigarette packet, grab the packet. You have to take one cigarette, you have to find a lighter, you have to light up the cigarette and just at the hand you have to smoke. So you have to complete these other actions that are ex expressed by verbs. But until you don't want to do something like that, you will probably try to splitting that with different functions. And the first idea is something like that. It's not that good. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing that emerged from that is public and private keywords. Because when it comes with public and private, public accessor, it seems that that is the key to move from OOP through procedural code. In fact, this is the sentence that expressed my feeling that if you give the developers the opportunity to make something wrong, they will surely do it. The problem is about public and private accessors is the fact that you can decide if you want, and a lot of people are going to do that, to remove those methods that are going to encapsulate your states and exposing with public keywords directly here side and body look but an different object in your world are going to access that and this is not a tale about concurrency or race conditions this is I, I, I don't want neither to land to concurrency because this is really, uh, it's another story. But being stick with a single thread, you have different objects that can put in those internal variables the logic they, they need to, and you have no control. So public and private accessor are the first wrong thing that Java, C Sharp, and all the OOP mainstream languages are offering you as the way to get out from OOP. And all of us is actually using it because you're even forced to do that. that. The truth, and small, small talk is done with like that, is that object data variable should be private by design. You, you should not have, a, have the possibility to use public or private accessors. And it's the same for methods that are the behavior. They should be public by design. 
When it comes to inheritance, the thing that uh, Helen Keyes is really disappointed about, if you stay there and you imagine your domain, you, you will probably do something like that. Maybe you can do it better, but it will be something like that. Person, gender, female, male. There's a cigarette that becomes a big cigarette. That is a cigarette that uh, uh, he, from when older, he would like to become something like a slim cigarette. And the code is going to be something like the bold and beautiful. <laughs> and it's going to be a big mess. But the real problem about high inheritance is this one. The square and rectangle problem, even known as the circle and the ellipse problem. You will probably design a rectangle with those behavior and accessor, set width, get width, and blah, 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 blah. One day, probably, in your code, will happen that you need to think about a square. But the square, as the set side, he doesn't have, you, you should not be able to change the dimension of the, of the square of the height of the width. But due to the fact that you're extending your rectangle, and those are public, because the rectangle is fine with that, you're in the extension action. Probably you will do something like set side. And there's the violation of SRP. So this is intrinsic with the high inheritance. You cannot do nothing more. So this is just one thing. We have about OP as we know it, public and private accessor bad. We have inheritance. At the moment, we cannot consider even an inheritance because this is what happens for the 90% of the time. The second, the third, sorry, important thing is the myth that everything is an object. Because the more you will study, the more, this is what happened to me. You will read books, you will get the blue book, you will read about the Gang of Four design patterns and blah, 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 clean code. You will understand a lot of great things about computer programming. But when it, it comes to OOP, probably you will try to split your code, take those methods and verbs out of the class person, and something like that is going to happen. Maybe you can do it better. You can imagine all the, all the object that you want. But the real problem is that you can shape the things as the best as you can, but all those are going to be container of verbs. As you can see, you have to grab, to choose, to open, to cast, to share, and blah, blah, blah. So the tale is about knowns, but knowns identify subjects of your phrase and are brought in life by verbs. But the a single verb definition is about other verbs. But just one is the behavior. What I mean is that everything is an object. As the first, ex, the first case to generate wrong code by design because you need to think about new knowns where to put inside new verbs that are just there to complete your behavior. In a different word, it should be something like that. You have the class person and smoking, and through functional composition, you should obtain the behavior of smoking. And in a module, you should have the verbs there. Maybe you will generalize it and composing that until you will be able to smoke. Actually, at the moment, you can do that uh, with languages like JavaScript. Maybe just the good part. So the question that comes in mind is, how can it be possible that a well-known paradigm is so wrong? Because every, every one of us is thinking about OOP, and it seems really weird that we are 
using something that is wrong from the base, from the foundations. Because when it comes with the high inheritance, when it comes with the accessors, when it comes with the thing that the world we are talking about is so made of object, and those are the things that I talked about, well, how can it be possible that a paradigm is so wrong? Well, the key is in the paradigm definition, because a paradigm definition is this one. A paradigm is just a um, central framework for how you view the world around you. And it can be so pervasive that will become almost unnoticed. This is a, a phrase from Thomas Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolution that is one of, is the Bible of science. Thomas Kuhn is a philosopher that care, cared, because he's not living anymore, about science. And when it comes to paradigm, his vision is that science is made of paradigms. But the real evolution, what comes to progress, the progress is defined by paradigm switch. That is the key. A paradigm is just something like how you, you view and perceive the world around you. And it can be so pervasive to be almost unnoticed. This is not so different from a habit. Even a habit is something light, something that is so pervasive that you are going to do it all the time, all the day, and you will never feel it because it's a habit. So why I gave you this talk? I gave you this talk because I really tried in the years of software development to improve my code. I really tried to save OOP, but there's something really wrong with that. Because your code is made up of a lot of knowns that are unuseful. You should be able to use verbs, combine them until you get your behavior. That, that is how things should be done. And that is how what you can be able to do with functional programming. The best thing, actually, because uh, if you stay with a functional language like Haskell or some really functional language, the problem is that they, are, they have different problems. But if you do with some language that is multi-paradigm, you probably will be able to create object, combine function, put your function that are verbs in a different module, and uh, through ab uh, functional composition, generate your behavior. So I know how much time I have, but maybe it's too, it's too much because I'm already at the conclusions. The conclusion is that if your language forces you to start with the code, the code with the keyword class, you cannot do nothing about that. Probably your code will be made up of a lot of knowns that will try to walk around in your world, but they are just companion of verbs. The verb is the central thing of your code, because what we do, even when we speak or when, when I, sm I smoke, the thing that I do is an action that is made up of different words because the definition of a, a verb is made up by different verbs. And so the constraint to create your code by starting with the class that will define a known is not good for what we do. OOP was the dream of Alan Kay, but how 
we are able at the moment to do that is through languages, mainstream languages like Java, like C Sharp, like C++ that are stick with that, with the class. You have to create classes. And that is the key point when you see your code that is full of knowns. You will stay there with high inheritance and you will, uh, you will land in the rectangle and square problem, circular ellipse, call it as you prefer, and you don't have to choose. You, you can do all the refactor that you want, but there's something really wrong in the OOP. I know that you got it. <laughs> the second conclusion, and then if you have any question, the second important conclusion is that when you do OP, the most of the time, smoking a cigarette is not that easy. Thank you. I know that I'm, I'm a lucky guy and there's not so many OOP programmer in here, so no, I guess no questions. Anyone? Okay. Yes. Yes, this is true because Heinertens. Oh, okay, sorry. I will do it for him. Okay. He just said that OP is really. No, I'm joking. <laughs> He just said uh, that by his experience in a large project that are made up with OOP, the, correct me if I'm wrong, that the key point is that you think about the fact that inheritance is what you have to do to do OOP. And your code will explode and you will create families like the Forester. And the final question is about if I believe that the problem is just inheritance or if the problem is about OOP. Is it the question? Yes, this is one key point. My personal belief is a little different, but Due to the fact that uh, even in uh, the first de definition of a small talk, in the first implementation, you had to deal with inheritance, and all the language that came from that have inheritance as the first thing. And if you probably studied in the university in here in Bologna, you will stay. Uh, you will. You had listened to some professor telling you that one of the key points of the OOP is inheritance. Probably, the final result is what you're thinking about, that you have to generate a lot of families and hierarchy of knowns. But my personal belief is that we can save OOP, but we need a multi-paradigm, and we need to get back the freedom to verbs. You should be able to have verbs generalized in a different module they can do whatever they want, and you should be able to compose in the behavior of an object. So objects for me are still valid, but not as they are defined in Java or C Sharp. That is my personal belief. I've even tried that. Uh, well, the only one language that I, I've done it, and I don't know if there are others, is JavaScript, because JavaScript is the most powerful language. 
That's my point. Even if there are a lot of bad parts, and if you don't discover which are the good parts of JavaScript, you will probably kick it in the ass. That is the story of a JavaScript. But probably you will be able to do that with JavaScript, and is why they are trying to improve that. Because with ECMAScript 6, they are putting in the trash the prototypal inheritance, introducing classical inheritance. I don't know if I like that, but the, the, it's not that much good. And now, with the class definition, you can create that object and compose your function inside the behavior, leaving them in a different module. OK, all, all, all that we have learned from books like Clean Code, uh, DDD are still valid, but we have to organize things in a different way because OOP at the moment is just a thing about the organization of procedural code. There's nothing more. And it's really different from functional programming. Next one. Well, this is, that is the first step. That is the first step, and there are a lot of things to improve. And I'm quite happy with the thing that they introduced Lambda. But the fact is, Lambda is just helping you to the fact that you need to create anonymous classes and stuff like that. But your code, only but your code, at the time, need to stay in a Java file that is starting with the class co uh, keyword. And that is the point. You should be free to do whatever you want. You should be free to put verbs directly in the module. And maybe if you want to create a class and to put in the behavior the composition of generalized verbs functions. OK. Someone other? Well, my personal belief is state is something that we can really, we, we don't need state because the state is by definition past. The state is the past. If you think about web development, you don't need state. You can even just manipulate that and at that moment of time consider what is the state? And do other action, do things. You will have conditions, but on that moment in time, so keeping a state encapsulated is unuseful. Why should you do that? And that's a good thing about functional programming, is the fact that you, you have immutable thing that, will, that is the main constraint to avoid keeping the state for a long time. Okay. Separate behaviors to object as a structure, the representation of your type correct. Yeah, yeah. So at that point you still need inheritance because we don't need polymorphism at this point because it's separated. Well I I will save uh, interfaces. Probably interfaces will be there and they are useful. But inheritance of objects, that is the crap. What about Ruby where you can create new class uh, or runtime? Ruby is one of the language that uh, will let you create something like that. Runtime. Yes, because in Ruby you are free to do, to create verbs and if you want to create classes. So Ruby is a, a great deal with that as, uh, well, maybe. Maybe it's better than JavaScript. <laughs> OK. Yes, I uh, was also wondering that, for example, in objective-oriented languages, uh -huh. there are a lot of methods uh, of, that could drive the design of the code. Like, for example, UML, or example, the Kango 4 design patterns that you mentioned before. And I was wondering if there was a mapping between those paradigms of developing code and functional languages. 
Um, sorry, I don't, I don't get your point. Can you please explain yeah. in a different example, way? If I have a problem, I could uh, model it mm -hmm. through a UML diagram. Okay, perfect. Well, my, I'm, I'm, I'm not really happy with the UML. I've done it a lot of time because I, I was really convinced that that was the way to go to have active documentation. Then you have to generate your object. But uh, I ended to work for one entire year drawing squares. And time, thank you for the... The fact is that UML will lead you to inheritance. That is the point of UML. UML is born to manage inheritance. And my personal belief is that we should really forget about UML. Because probably if you do UML, you're not going to do TDD. That is uh, what will probably save you from creating the Forrester family. That is what I think about. Okay. For me, there's just one solution. He knows. Code them. Code them. You don't have to write and to design. To, you don't have to draw because we are coders. And you need to try to do TDD. Maybe not at the extreme. I, I think that the uh, upfront design is still giving us some, something do good. But when it comes to code, you need to code. That is the only thing that you can do to write not that much code, good code, and useful code. That is it. Someone? Have we done? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.